The Bible speaks about the battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. The Bible also speaks about the return of Christ and the ultimate destruction of Satan's kingdom. In this video, we're going to deal with the topic of the Antichrist. We need to turn, first of all, to the passage in 1 John chapter 2, verses 18-23, through 23, where this is primarily described. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. What exactly does the term Antichrist mean? The word Christ is derived from the Greek word Christos, which corresponds exactly to the Hebrew word Mashiach, from which we get Messiah. When we say Antichrist, we mean anti-Messiah. The word anti is a Greek preposition. It has two meanings, both of which are correct. First and foremost, it means against. So the first operation is against Messiah. The second definition is in place of. The ultimate goal is to replace the true Messiah with a false Messiah. As a result, the entire operation is divided into two phases. According to the Bible, his goal is to replace the true Messiah with a false Messiah. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, we read, This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. When we combine this with a passage from 1 John chapter 2, we see three forms of Antichrist. First and foremost, there are numerous Antichrists. Many Antichrists have appeared and manifested throughout human history. Second, there is the Antichrist, a specific individual. This is the final manifestation, the final result of the Antichrist spirit, which has yet to be revealed in human history. Many believe his shadow has already fallen across the stage. However, Scripture makes it clear that at the end of this stage there will be one final, supremely evil, supremely powerful ruler who will dominate the human race for a brief period of time who will be the Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist is the third form. The spirit of Antichrist is the spirit that permeates all Antichrists. And John has given us some very important signs of the spirit of the Antichrist. First and foremost, it begins with God's people. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, John says of the Antichrists, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest, that none of them were of us. As a result, Antichrist is always associated in some way with God's people. However, it does not truly belong there, and this will become clear in due course. This is one of the characteristics of the Antichrist spirit. The second is that it rejects Jesus as the Messiah, as seen in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. Then John adds the third mark. He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. This is extremely important. The Antichrist does not deny God's existence. He even claims to be God's representative. He does, however, deny the relationship between the Father and the Son within the Godhead. And the fourth mark of the Antichrist, according to 1 John chapter 4, is that it denies Messiah has come. It most likely believes in Messiah who will come, but denies that Messiah has already come. The Individual Now I'd like to look into the Antichrist, the final manifestation of the spirit of Antichrist. Let us have a look at some key passages of Scripture. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 covers the man of lawlessness. Now, in regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in our gathering together to meet Him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly unsettled or alarmed either by a spirit or a message or a letter alleged to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. 
Let no one in any way deceive or entrap you, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man of destruction, the Antichrist, the one who is destined to be destroyed, who opposes and exalts himself so proudly and so insolently above every so-called God or object of worship so that he actually enters and takes his seat in the temple of God, publicly proclaiming that he himself is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now from being revealed? It is so that he will be revealed at his own appointed time. For the mystery of lawlessness, rebellion against divine authority, and the coming reign of lawlessness is already at work but it is restrained only until he who now restrains it is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed and the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and bring him to an end by appearance of his coming. The coming of the Antichrist, the lawless one, is through the activity of Satan, attended with great power, all kinds of counterfeit miracles and deceptive signs and false wonders, all of them lies and by unlimited seduction to evil and with all the deception of wickedness for those who are perishing, because they did not welcome the love of the truth, of the gospel, so as to be saved, they were spiritually blind and rejected the truth that would have saved them. Because of this, God will send upon them a misleading influence, an activity of error and deception, so they will believe the lie, in order that all may be judged and condemned who did not believe the truth about their sin and the need for salvation through Christ, but instead took pleasure in unrighteousness. But we should and are morally obligated as debtors always to give thanks to God for you, believers beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through the sanctifying work of the Spirit that sets you apart for God's purpose, and by your faith in the truth of God's Word that leads you to spiritual maturity. It was to this end that He called you through our gospel, the good news of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, so that you may obtain and share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold tightly to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting comfort and encouragement and the good, well-founded hope of salvation by his grace, comfort and encourage and strengthen your hearts, keeping them steadfast on course in every good work and word. Paul addresses the Antichrist's appearance, revelation and manifestation in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He also speaks about preparing for the Lord's return. And they are inextricably linked because the final satanic act before the Lord's return will be the revealing of the Antichrist. Indeed, Paul claims that the Lord will destroy the Antichrist with the brightness of his appearing. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we read, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us. The word coming there is the Greek word parousia, which is normally used to refer to Jesus' second coming. Because Paul knew that many Christians would be willing to believe specific predictions about when Jesus would return, he wrote, Don't be shaken or troubled, neither by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Don't be deceived as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. The Greek word for falling away is apostasia, which means apostasy, a deliberate rejection of revealed truth. This verse mentions two names for the Antichrist, First and foremost, he is the man of sin, or, more accurately, the man of lawlessness. He is the ultimate manifestation of man's rebellion against God and rejection of God's laws. He is also known as the son of perdition, or the one who is doomed to an eternity of torment. The only person in the New Testament who is referred to as the son of perdition is Judas Iscariot. He is a forgery of an apostle. As a result, we have three names for the same being, the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, and the son of perdition. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, we find another significant name, 
This is part of a vision John had during his revelation. Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? The fourth title is revealed here, the beast, a person who will arise to whom Satan, the dragon, will give his power. Why will Satan give this person his power? Because doing so will allow this person to gain dominion over the entire human race and persuade the entire human race to do what Satan desires most, worship him. This is his objective. He has been working on this patiently for many centuries and he is now very close to achieving his goal. One of his heads had been mortally wounded and then healed. There is a kind of false resurrection going on here. I'm not sure if this person will be assassinated, but he will apparently die and then resurrect. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, John saw a vision of a scroll in God's hand, and no one was found worthy to open the scroll. As a result, John was sobbing. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. John was looking for a lion, but the lion turned out to be a lamb. That is an intentional contradiction. God's appointed ruler does not have the beastly nature. He possesses the nature of the lamb and he is exalted above all others because he gave us his life. He lowered his head. Because he did not resist his arresters and persecutors, he chose the path of meekness and humility. In Revelation chapter 13, verses 6 and 7, we see the Antichrist take action. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. It was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. He is a direct challenger to God. He is not a hidden adversary. He raises his fist in the face of Almighty God. And who do you think gave him permission to go to war with and defeat the saints? I'm assuming it's God, which is a sobering thought. Let us not forget that Christianity is not all about easy victories. Let us continue with verse 8. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. What a powerful statement. Except for those chosen by God, the entire human race will worship Him. 